Welcome to NOAA Central Library's platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. My name is Lisa, and I am your NOAA Central Library host. Today's library seminar kicks off the 2021 Knauss Fellows Lunch and Learn series, a monthly webinar where Knauss Fellows showcase their own research. Kimberly Animus from a 2020, I'm sorry, 2021 Knauss Fellow working with the National Science Foundation, will introduce our two speakers today, El Wibisono and Sean Mullen, each of whom will speak for 20 to 25 minutes, followed by five to seven minutes of questions and answers. Before I turn this webinar over to our speakers, uh, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This usually resets the software, and resolves most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel by later today. We encourage you to ask questions, which the speakers will address at, e at the end of each of their presentations. So type your questions throughout the seminar in the questions chat box located in the control panel. And with that last detail, I'm gonna turn this presentation over to Kim. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our first Lunch and Learn webinar. Our first speaker is going to be El Wibisono. El grew up in Indonesia, and she received her bachelor's degree from Wellesley College. After graduating, she worked for the Nature Conservancy Indonesia on the sustainable management of the snapper grouper fishery. She received her PhD from the University of Rhode Island in 2020, or 2020, where her research also focused on the snapper grouper fishery. She's also the artist behind the web and Instagram page fishery.co, um, in which she uses art to educate the public on sustainable fisheries. So Elle, take it away. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to um, today's presentation for the Canals Lunch and Learn. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Kim. But yes, yeah, so my name is Elva Bisono, and I recently graduated from the Humphreys Lab at the University of Rhode Island, where I studied the characteristics and potential management of the Indonesian deep slope demersal fishery. So for the next 20, 25 minutes, um, I'm just going to share with you my research that I've done for the past five years. I'm working with the Nature Conservancy and doing my PhD. PhD. And if you, like me, are tuning in from Washington, D.C., hopefully for the next 20 minutes, I can share some slivers of tropical weather and lots of fish on this very gloomy and rainy day. So, um, before one, one we second. start... Oh, yes? One quick. Actually, I, I, you need to uh, share your, your screen with us. I think you might have uh, stopped sharing it with us. Oh, oh, I am so sorry. There um, you go. Perfect. Okay. I, I clicked the wrong button as I was trying to turn on my video. Sorry about that. Um, so before we start, um, so what exactly is the Indonesian deep slope demersal fishery? So to answer that question, first let's um, orient ourselves. And if you're in the US, like where I am right now, we'll be right here. And Indonesia is all the way over there. And you might notice that, wow, like the um, the width of Indonesia is almost the same width as the United States. And that is absolutely correct. What is really different is Indonesia's coastline is more than three times longer than the US coastline because it's separated among 17,000 different islands. Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world. So now starting to think about um, fishery data collection and fishery management, it starts to become really clear why it's such a complex space and why the logistics of it is really challenging. So at the same time, it's not surprising that Indonesian fisheries is completely open access, which means that um, anybody, anywhere, anytime can catch whatever they want. And um, the data uh, for this fishery is very much data poor. So the deep slope part um, of this fishery just means where the fish is being caught, and it could be either continental shelves or slopes or seamounts. And they're typically targeted either by um, bottom long lines or drop lines. 
And the fishing vessels really varies from one gross tons to 150 gross tons. And when we're looking at vessel sizes at about one GT, they're, they're basically canoes. They're not very big at all. And the fishing depth also varies from 50 to 500 meters. And a lot of it is related to what fishing gear that they're using. So if they're fishing using long lines, typically they fish in less deep areas and drop lines tend to fish in deeper areas. Um, the demersal part of this fishery just means that this fishery is targeting fish that is bottom associated. And in this case, it's more than 100 species of snappers and groupers. So what does 100 species of snappers and groupers look like? It looks like um, a little bit like this, which is very diverse. A lot of the snappers are red in color and they're all just clumped together under this umbrella term red snapper. Or it could also look like this. Um, these photos are taken pre-COVID and this is from a fish market in East Java. And there I am doing my data collection. So this fishery is very diverse um, and it's data poor, but it's also a very economically lucrative fishery. Um, the snapper grouper fishery positions Indonesia as the second largest snapper exporter in the world. Um, one of the largest importers of Indonesian snappers are actually um, the United States. So if you buy your snapper fillets, maybe um, most likely it comes from Indonesia. But like most um, data poor fisheries, um, we always start with the fishery data. And then we use the fishery data to conduct assessments using different fishery indicators. And depending on the assessment result, um, the fishery could be doing um, pretty well. And the management action that follows that would just be to maintain the fishery. But if based on the assessment, the fishery is not doing so well, then um, different management actions could be taken. And these are just some examples, but it could be controlling fishing effort, either through limiting licenses or through gear restrictions. Um, in this particular Indonesian fishery, again, just because the data is so limited, um, we focus on using several fishery indicators. And the first indicator we use is a length-based indicator um, that is showing the different life history parameters. So the assumption here is that the fish length is indicative of the fish age. And there are four life history um, parameters that we look at. And the first one is the length at maturity. So fish that are smaller than the length at maturity has never spawned yet. They're basically immature. And you have the optimum fishing length, the asymptotic length, and the maximum length. What's really interesting with each of these life history parameters is that there are ratios between them. It's not the most exact ratio, but for the most part, if you know just one of them, you can calculate the rest. And in a fishery, um, when you're looking at the catch, ideally you wanna see no immature fish in the catch. 100% um, of the catch needs to be larger than the optimum fishing length. And about 20 to 30%, you wanna see it be around um, the asymptotic length. The next fishery indicator that we use, um, and it's quite common for data for fisheries to use this fishery indicator is spawning potential ratio. And the SPR is basically the ratio between the spawning stock biomass in an exploited fishery and in a pristine fishery. And what we mean by the spawning stock biomass is just all of the mature fish in the stock. So when you have a fishery with SPR equals 100%, that means the amount of mature fish in that stock, even though it's exploited, is the same like in a pristine fishery. So as a rule of thumb, the higher SPR is the better. And typically fishery managers use 40% as a target reference point in fisheries and 25% as the limit reference point. And what it means is that once the fishery hits SPR 25%, it typically triggers different management actions to make sure that we rebuild the fishery so the SPR um, reaches the 40% target. The next fishery indicator we use in this fishery is the trade limits because we started no noticing that there are different price premiums um, depending on the fish size. So a fishery has a high risk of overexploitation when there is a higher price for the smaller immature fish and conversely, um, the fishery has a low risk of overexploitation when the price premium is for the larger um, already mature fish. So we start off with this problem of a data poor fishery that is very complex. And then um, through the research, we hope to be able to get the characteristics of the fishery and hopefully um, come up with different management strategies. 
So in order to achieve that goal, um, our roadmap for today is um, we're going to talk about developing and testing the data collection method that we deployed in Indonesia. And then we're going to talk about the basic characteristics of the fishery that we found based on the data collection. And then using the fishery indicators that we just discussed to assess the sustainability of the fishery. And then we're going to wrap up with talking about how can we possibly improve the uh, sustainability of this fishery. So um, let's get started. So prior to my PhD program, I was working with the Nature Conservancy back in Indonesia. and. Around that time, we were thinking about different strategies to collect data. And that's where we came up with this coder system or the crew operated data recording system. And basically in this data recording system, we equip fishers and fishing captains with a measuring board and cameras. And we ask them to take photographs of the fish on the measuring board. Um, and we do ask them to take photos of their entire catch. And we also um, deployed GPS trackers on the fishing vessels that um, records the vessel coordinates at every hour. So from these two different data streams, we have the species, uh, the fish species and the length of the fish and also the different fishing grounds. And to date, since 2015, um, coders have been deployed throughout Indonesia. And up to August 2020, we have partnered with more than 600 fishers, and that amounts to more than 3.5 million fish photographs, and that came from about 16,000 plus fishing trips. So huge kudos to the entire um, research team back in Indonesia, because it's a lot of fish photographs to go through. And all of those data is great, but um, is it good data? And to answer that question, we um, compared the total weight of the catch from a fishing trip between the coders data and a control data set. And for this particular um, uh, study, we used the fishing receipts as our control data set because Fish, um, fishers usually have their fishing costs um, fronted by the fish traders. And as um, in return, these fishers need to sell their entire catch to the fish traders. So between August and December, um, several years ago, I did my data collection. Um, it consisted uh, of doing a lot of talking with the captains and um, asking for them to share their receipts with me. And comparing and in while asking for the receipts, um, it does not always look like how you expect them to look like, but uh, we persevere. We collect the data anyway. And in comparing the total weight of the receipts here on the x-axis and the total weight from the coders data on the y-axis, we actually noticed that um, the coders data are capturing or recording more fish than the receipts data. And Partly it's probably because um, a lot of the fish are used as bait um, on board or eaten on board or even sold to other, other buyers, even though technically they are not supposed to do that. But what this really um, emphasizes is the importance of doing onboard data collection, because if you wait until the fishers offload their catch um, at the shore, then you're going to miss some of these um, catches. From the results, we also found that only five species contributed to 50% of the total catch. So this narrows down the species that we need to focus on in order to manage this fishery. And three of them is snappers here on the top row, and you have one grouper and a croaker. And we also found that the vessels are dispropor disproportionately small in this fishery, and a lot of them are just between one to 10 gross tons. And here I just like to share this photo of these fishers offloading the fish um, and the way they do it. I mean, um, they just float it in the water and bring it to the beach. I thought that was quite ingenious. And by filtering the GPS um, trackers based on the depth and the speed of the vessel, we isolated these uh, fishing grounds throughout Indonesia. And again, because we saw so many fish um, through the photographs, we are actually seeing fish that has the maximum length larger than previously recorded, even those recorded in fish base. 
So what that allowed us to do is to update all of the LMAX or the maximum length and then back calculate all of the other life history parameters. And that really allowed us to be quite confident, uh, quite confident in the parameters that we use because we know that it comes from the latitudinal range of the Indonesian fishery. And using this updated life history parameters, we constructed different length frequency distributions where you have the fish length on the x-axis and then the frequency or how many fish was caught um, here on the y-axis. And this is just an example of the top species, uh, one of the many red snappers, um, in this case Legenus malabaricus. And you'll see that a lot of the fish are caught smaller than the length at maturity. Most of the fish are caught smaller than the optimum fishing length. And here is another example of a different species. And you see a pretty similar trend where a lot of the fish is caught smaller than the length at maturity. And most of the fish is caught smaller than the optimum fishing length. And even though these are just two example length frequency distributions, unfortunately, it's quite um, it's a pretty common trend to see this um, to see these with the other species in this fishery. And so just based on the length indicators um, from the catch, uh, there is a quite a high risk of overexploitation um, in this fishery, especially for those caught um, in the Java Sea. Moving on to the different um, fishery indicators, based on the trade limits, um, these three snappers have a high risk of overexploitation because there's a price premium um, for the fish that is smaller um, than the length at maturity. And based on the SPR, they also have a high risk of overexploitation because the SPR was, is well below 25% for these species. Um, I would like to note that for this one grouper species down here, the Epinephalus areolatus, um, it actually has a low risk of overexploitation based on the trade limit and has a medium risk of overexploitation based on the SPR. And we're going to revisit this one grouper species here, Epinephalus areolatus, so try to keep the name in mind. But for now, we're going to talk about the tree snappers right here and why there's such a high risk of overexploitation based on the trade limit. And the reason for that is the high demand for plate size fillets or plate size snappers. Um, for the species in this deep water fishery, they grow to pretty big sizes and they have a pretty slow growth. So typically when fishers or consumers are demanding for these plate size fish, they're still immature when they're being caught. So there's definitely a disconnect between consumer preference and the sustainability of it here in, for this fishery. And so now we know that catching juvenile fish is a problem in this fishery and it's quite prevalent. Um, so I constructed a generalized additive model or GAMS to determine factors that lead to high proportions of mature fish in the catch. And to do that, um, I use a combination of different fishing factors and environmental factors. And as part of the environmental factors, I included the BPR, bathymetric position index and the roughness. And just a very brief explanation of the BPI and roughness. Uh, for the BPI, more positive BPI just means that it's on like crest and lower BPI values means that it's in valleys and well, certain fishing areas are just more rough and other areas are less rough. So from the model, we found that um, some factors have a positive correlation with more mature fish in the catch, and well, other factors have a negative correlation with more mature fish in the catch. As um, I think what is really interesting is that as part of the factors that are correlated with more mature fish in the catch is catching this two species, um, the Epinephalus areolatus, or our grouper, which we just talked about, and the Atrabuca brevis, or a croaker. And the reason why these um, leads to more mature fish in the catch is because the Epinephalus um, areolatus spends most of its juvenile days in the shallow coral reef areas. And the croaker similarly spends most of its juvenile days also in the more shallow, silty, muddy estuarine areas. And so by the time it grows and hits maturity and moves to the deeper waters where it overlaps with this fishery, um, it's already mature. So there is a separation between the juvenile habitat and the mature habitat and where this fishery um, operates. 
And also this model explain about 72% of the deviance in the data. So knowing all of the different factors that lead to the different proportions of the mature fish in the catch, I'd like to extrapolate that throughout Indonesian waters. So to that, I created a grid throughout Indonesian waters and at each coordinate um, predict how much uh, fish are being caught that's mature versus how much is being, uh, how much fish caught is immature. And based on that simulation, um, we identified several juvenile hotspots. And we defined these juvenile hotspots as areas where more than 75% of the simula simulated catches are immature. And you will notice that there are several hotspots in Indonesia, but not all of them has the same importance. Because if we um, overlap these hotspots with the pre-existing fishing areas, not all of them really overlaps. So, oops, so let's just focus on the hotspots that overlap with um, common fishing grounds. And we have this. I'd like to point out that the red boxes in this map denotes pre-existing marine protected areas or MPAs. And here we're just gonna zoom in into the two main hotspots, which is the Java Sea Makassar Strait hotspot and also the Savu Sea hotspot. Um, what's really interesting is that there's already an overlap between pre-existing marine protected areas and these juvenile hotspots, which um, makes us believe that there is probably, um, is probably a good idea to strengthen or even expand the networks of MPAs because the juvenile fish in this fishery could really benefit from protection in these juvenile hotspots. So thinking about how we can improve the sustainability of this fishery, um, we believe that the expansion of MPAs to prioritize deep slope demersal fisheries would be really important. I think to date, a lot of focus on MPAs in Indonesia, especially, is very much coral reef um, fisheries or just coral reef um, in general heavy. But um, I think this makes a case where um, the deep slope demersal fisheries could really benefit from protection in this area. However, we do need to do um, more research using better habitat data to be able to really pinpoint, for example, where in the Java Sea or where in the Makassar Strait um, would these um, networks of MPAs be. And we also believe that effort control on key areas such as the Java Sea and Makassar Strait will be really important. Um, historically, the Java Sea and Makassar Strait has always had a really high rate of fish exploitation in Indonesia. So we kind of had an idea that this will be um, a key area that we'll need to focus on reducing effort. And thirdly, I think from the consumer side, changing that market preference for plate sized fish would be um, really beneficial to this fishery. So with that, um, I'd like to thank um, the Poseidon Group, the Nature Conservancy, and all of the grants that made this research possible. And I will take any questions. Thank you very much. That was super fascinating, Al. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Audience, we have uh, about seven minutes for your questions. So I encourage you to type them in the questions chat box, and then I will read them to our speakers, our speaker, excuse me. Um, and meanwhile, I just also wanna remind you, if you joined us late, that we are recording this presentation. So if you do uh, have, know somebody who would be interested in Elle's work, please uh, forward the recording, which will be on uh, the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel to that person. So I'm going to wait another minute. Uh, sometimes there's a delay uh, in your, you getting questions to us. Oh, here we go. First question. It says, great talk, L. How well are the marine protected areas around Indonesia enforced? Great question. So most of the marine protected areas in Indonesia, unfortunately, are paper parks. Um, so they're not well enforced at all. But it does not mean that enforcement is completely impossible because uh, marine protected areas around Raja Ampat, for example, is actually pretty well enforced and pretty well monitored. So I think it's a matter of how much resources we have to do those um, enforcements and what priorities do we want to um, put in um, in terms of allocating those resources um, between the different MPAs. Raja Ampat, for example, is one of the premier tourist scuba diving destinations um, in the world. So there's a lot of um, international 
um, but he's, that's really invested in Raja Ampat and it's always in the news. So I guess um, there is a vested interest to make sure that the marine protected area there is um, protected. But I think I'd like to make the case that because this fishery is so important um, economically, that maybe we can also try to put in that same amount of effort and resources if we do make MPAs for this fishery. Great, thank you, Al. There are lots of questions coming in. Uh, this next question asks, was it difficult to find participants for the vessel tracking and photographs? Um, it was definitely more difficult at first um, because it has never been done before and there was there were some questions about like the data conf confidentiality and stuff like that. But as more and more fishers participate, it becomes a lot easier for us to um, expand and have other fishers um, join in because we already we can say like oh yes um 300 fishers join and they have no problems um as far as the vessel tracking device goes that i was actually quite nervous when i first had to go around and ask fishers if i could deploy them on their um, fishing vessels because i thought all right no one is going to allow me um to do this but as it turns out a lot of fishers are really receptive for it because we give access to view the tracking device to the families of the fisher so it becomes sort of like a safety feature and like the family of the fishers like that being able to track where their husband is when they go fishing um, especially when it's outside of um, cellular range and also by having those um, gps we've managed to kind of like pinpoint and where to rescue some vessels that had some mechanical problems and just started drifting out in the sea so yeah, it was actually a pretty, uh, uh, a lot of fishers were really interested in the tracking device in the end, um, to my surprise. That's really interesting. Uh, and this next question asks, there's obviously a lot of unreported catch. Is this factored into management at all? Yeah, so the idea of um, into coders is we are trying to capture the unreported catch, um, obviously, it's hard to tell if they're capturing exactly 100% of their total catch or not. And we know that we have difficulty with them um, taking photographs of sharks, because even though they're not, it's not legal to capture sharks in Indonesia, there's always some sort of trouble with enforcement. And sometimes you get fishing vessels confiscated because they catch sharks. It's, it's sort of a really murky area. So they tend to shy away from taking photographs of sharks in particular. And we've been trying to increase the compliance um, in taking shark photographs and ensuring them that, no, 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 we're really, we're not here to report you to the authorities or anything like that. We really just wanna know what you're capturing. And as far as pre-existing management and if unreported catch um, is factored into the pre-existing management, um, well, first, it's not being factored into the pre-existing management, but at the same time, it almost does not matter because the management doesn't really exist. It kind of exists in paper, but it's never implemented and it's really never enforced. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think I think so. It did me. Um, this will probably have to be our last question since we have another presentation. But uh, just before I, I say I tell you what it is, I wanted to let the audience know that I will be forwarding any questions that were unanswered to Elle so she can uh, respond offline. Uh, this next last question it asks, can you differentiate juvenile areas from areas that are overfished, i.e. no more large mature fish? Yeah, that is a really great question because, um, and we were pondering about that too, because, all right, it's, are we seeing a lot of juveniles because like you said, it's overfished or is it because um, the habitat is for juveniles? But I think just from looking at the literature on what we know about the juvenile habitat preference are from the depth or um, mainly from the depth and where we're seeing the adults, um, I think there's a good reason to believe that these places that um, where we saw the hotspots are actually juvenile habitats and not just severely overfished. Um, or at the same time, it could be both. It could be juvenile habitats and they're pretty hammered. Excellent. Thank you so much, Al. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Kim introduce um, Sean now, and I'm going to give Sean the screen. Great. Thank you, everybody.
Oh, make sure you unmute yourself, Kim. Oh, I just was rambling. Um, no, I said thank you, Elle. That was a really great presentation. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Sean Mullen. So Sean received his bachelor's degree in microbiology from UC Berkeley, and he received his PhD in geobiology from Caltech, where he worked alongside Victoria Orphan. His research focuses on the microbial ecology of the deep places of the world, from the continental deep biosphere to the deep oceans. So Sean, I'm looking forward to your chat and take it away. Thanks so much, Kim and Lisa and everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah, so my name is Sean Mullen. I'm the current CAS fellow working in the office of Representative Garamendi. Uh, he's a congressman from California. But I'm excited to sort of have this opportunity to reach back into my former life as a, as a researcher. And I'm going to be talking today about some of the work that I did in my PhD, looking at the microbial and animal communities and how those sort of match up against the biogeochemistry at a methane seep off the coast of Costa Rica. And you can see this is one of my favorite photos from the site. Um, this is uh, Alvin on the seafloor. And so really what I'd be focusing on today is some of the, the data that we're collecting from the seafloor, um, push cores and, and rocks on uh, these methane seeps. So before I get started, I do wanna just make sure that I, I say thank you to a whole host of folks that really made this possible. First and foremost, Victoria Orphan, who was my PhD thesis advisor at Caltech. Um, but also just the entire science party of the rockets ex expedition on the Atlantis cruises that we were on, as well as the um, Atlantis crew, of course, and, and the pilots and engineers of Alvin and Sentry, the, the two uh, vehicles that we used, as well as the National Science Foundation, which really made the work possible and funded our work. Um, and you can look forward to the paper, hopefully this year, I'm looking forward to submitting it, um, you know, as soon as appropriation season is done, so. Um, okay, so I just wanna get started by, uh, and getting everybody on the same page in terms of what a methane seep even is. So methane seeps are these widely distributed features on the seafloor um, where methane sort of gently suffuses the seafloor and really feeds a whole host of communities. They're very dynamic areas um, and they can be caused by a whole you know, range of, uh, of, of causes. But one particular cause that we've been focused on is um, methane seeps that occur at active fault areas. Um, and as you can see on these two maps on the right, um, on the bottom we have um, a list or lo locations where many of the hydrothermal vents and seeps are around the world. And you can see that it matches up really nicely with this map on the top, this classic old seafloor map, which really uh, shows some of the, the mid-ocean ridges and other tectonic plates. You can see those matches up, those match up quite nicely. At Mount 12, where I'm going to be talking about today, um, this is caused by uh, two plates interacting where the lower plate is uh, being subducted under the upper plate. And as that subduction happens, um, the, the water sort of starts coming out of that plate. So basically we have a fresh water source coming out of the lower plate and it infuses uh, and sort of travels up through the upper plate through, through some of these fracture zones, carrying with it uh, many different kinds of nutrients as well as methane that it picks up along the way. Um, so the really interesting geological sites as well as biological sites. Um, so what these sites look like on the seafloor, there's really amazing uh, biological hotspots of activity. And what's really causing it here is the, that exact methane that's coming out of the seafloor. So what happens is microorganisms in the sediment, um, which are commonly referred to as ANME, which stands for anaerobic methanotrophs, what they do is they take methane and sulfate and they convert that into bicarbonate, which is the source of like bicarbonate rocks, as well as sulfide. So these organisms are fascinating um, in part because they're archaea, uh, which is, uh, and they also work in conjunction as a, in, symbi in symbiosis with a sulfate reducing bacterial partner. Now that sulfide that that uh, partnership generates actually goes on to feed most of the animals, which are called chemosynthetic animals. Um, and so those animals play host to a, a wide array of different sulfide oxidizing bacteria um, that they either grow in their bodies, maybe on their bodies, and then they'll usually consume either the bacteria or they'll consume the byproducts of that bacteria. And that regenerates the sulfate for um, the, the broader community. In the real world, it looks something like this where uh, we have some, something looks like this, uh, maybe you can see this sort of shimmering water here. And that's indicative of a sort of a fresher water source. It's coming up from, from below, right? Maybe fresher water, maybe warmer water. Um, and it's sort of interacting with the, uh, the, the ocean floor water here. Uh, and then you can also see uh, those bacterial communities and anime communities growing up in these bacterial mats surrounding these, these water inputs. And so that's, again, oxidizing the methane and it's feeding these other mussels and other organisms that are around. Um, and then as a side note, 
um, the, because these are oxy, oxidizing the methane and generating that bicarbonate, you get these really large bicarbonate carbonate rock platforms that form as a direct result of microbial activity. And those are going to be really interesting. Um, I'll talk about them a little bit more later. Um, what's so, one, one thing that's so interesting about them is that the carbon that actually makes up these rocks tends to be very depleted in carbon-13, one particular isotope, as a direct result of the methane oxidation activity. So it's a really nice diagnostic signal for these rocks. I do want to also um, make sure that everyone knows about the ANMI themselves. They're these really fantastic organisms. As I mentioned, they're an uh, they are archaea, but there's not just one group of these ANMI. They're widely distributed within the archaea, um, and they actually play uh, host and, and sort of partner to these bacterial partners. So archaea, bacteria, right, they're both small, but they're on completely different domains of life. So we're seeing a really um, broad symbiosis happening here. And you can see on the right um, what these, the symbiosis actually looks like. Most of the time, you get these really beautiful um, conglomerates, aggregates of these anme and bacterial partners together, where the uh, anme are shown in red and the bacteria are in green. And we actually still don't uh, fully understand how this partnership works. It could be a, a direct electron transfer. That's one thing that the, uh, my, my old PhD lab is still working on unraveling. So there's very active work in that, in that sphere, uh, even still. So just some of the fundamental questions that we're interested in asking. First, just what is the sort of sphere of influence around a seep? And what I mean by that is, if you consider the seep as sort of a point source of energy on the seafloor, which you know sort of fundamentally removed from uh, the energy of the sun, um, how does that that sphere of influence, sort of that point source, expand outward from the center? How you detect the impacts and the gradient across that seep in terms of the microorganisms as well as the animals, and then. A similar note, do the carbonates in the sediments show differences in terms of how they express that, that, that gradient? And so are there just community differences uh, with those two different substrates in general? Can the carbonates themselves be used as a nice sort of historical recorder of seep activity? So if I found a uh, you know, fossil carbonate from one of these old seeps, what can I learn from, uh, uh, from that carbonate about the old seeps? And then lastly, can we understand anything about the niche differentiation of these really broad clades of anime organisms based on where we find them uh, at different locations in these seeps? So orient you here, we're on the west coast of Costa Rica. Um, and you can see there's this really beautiful trench, as I mentioned, that's caused by the one subducting plate on the lower side being subducted underneath the upper plate. And so we're specifically going to be looking at um, mound 12. So this is one one of many different um, seep sites that we explored on uh, on these various research cruises, but um, we did a number of a different, a lot of work at this particular site. So this is the result. This work is the result of 39 different dives on um, with Alvin, which is a, a three-person submersible that's hosted on the research vessel Atlantis, as well as 21 dives on um, AUV Sentry, which you can see on the bottom left here is dressed up like Wonder Woman for you know Women's Month. Um, <laughs> So there's 140 push cores, 221 carbonate rocks, just a ton of work went into this, and I'm only going to have a chance to tell you about just a little bit of it today. But um, Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so we have to kind of pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps here. So whoever is in the submarine that day, basically, we're just assigning them with the, the uh, the privilege, if you will, to uh, give us our first activity designations. So we just used three different designations for what we, the different habitats that we found around this seep site, active, transition, and inactive. Where active sites, you can see there's lots of carbonate, lots of different chemosynthetic fauna that were visible, really not a lot of sediment, maybe some microbial mat. Transition sites are going to be, you know, a little bit less active seeming. They're maybe still going to have some chemosynthetic fauna, but maybe it's also some non-chemosynthetic fauna. This is a, a photo of of tube worms, which are definitely chemosynthetic and actually are attached to carbonate rock. Um, but you can see they're kind of fuzzy looking, and that's because there's hydroids growing on those tube worms, which are typically not a chemosynthetic organism, actually very frequently are quite sensitive to the sulfide that, that is generated at these seeps. There's going to be a little bit more sediment at these sites. It's probably going to cover some of these carbonates. And then also inactive sites or sort of background seafloor sites. There's really no evidence of chemosynthetic activity whatsoever. Any animals you see are going to be, you know, mostly mobile, mobile fauna, mobile predators, that sort of thing. Um, if you see any carbonates, they're going to be long buried. Um, so really, just no ev evidence of, of chemosynthetic activity. So this is kind of what it looks like. You know, you know, it's a group process here, and a lot of what we're doing is processing mud. So it's a bit of a messy process, but we we turn that mud into a whole host of different 
uh, data streams, including um, sequencing the microbial community, the DNA in the microbial community, as well as just a, a lot of different geochemistry. You can see her um, full list. I can't tell you about all of it today, but a lot of what we do is we're processing both the raw sediment as well as squeezed pore water where we um, put the, the, the sediment into a squeezer apparatus where you use argon gas to, argon gas to, to push out the, the pore water and then al analyze it downstream. But we're gonna start with the DNA here. Um, so just to orient you with what this is actually showing you, this is an NMDS, a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. And so you can sort of think about this plot as um, each one of these different points, different uh, dots on this plot is, a, is an individual sample with thousands of embedded dimensions where each one of those dimensions is a particular microbial species. So it's kind of analogous to a PCA plot if you're familiar with that. Um, but the important thing to take away here is that the more distance between any two points, the more difference there is between the microbial community of those two points, those two samples. So right away here, um, this is a sort of nice way to uh, uh, visualize and, and get a baseline for what our, our data looks like. So I sort of see four broad groupings. Um, so there's the carbonates, all of the carbonates from any, any of the sites, active, inactive or transition, sort of grouped together. Uh, and then the sediments, which are these more colorful points, um, sort of group uh, into these three other groupings. So we can start to layer on um, some, uh, some metadata into this here. And we can assign, say, uh, we can see that there's two sort of groups of active sites. These are those, uh, the circle, circular points. And then all the transition and inactive cores tend to sort of group together. So we actually can't distinguish between transition and inactive sediments in terms of the microbial community. But there does seem to be quite a big difference in the active cores. And these group ones um, active cores are, are particularly interesting to us because they are so similar to the carbonate rocks, this carbonate rocks uh, group. And these are from a particular location at Mount 12 that we deemed Yetisburg. Um, and the reason for that designation I'm going to show you here is because of um, a particular animal called uh, Kiwa Purvida or the Costa Rican Yeti crab. So these are these little crabs here that you can see. Um, they are called Yeti crabs specifically because they are fuzzy, um, and the fuzz is actually uh, specialized hairs they have in their bodies that they use to grow bacteria. So they basically farm bacteria and then eat them. And the reason they're sort of waving their arms in this really um, fantastically cute fashion is because they're actually sort of trying to uh, sort of increase the uh, availability of, of sulfide to, their back, to the bacteria that they're growing. And you can see there's lots of different organisms around too. It's a big carbonate platform, it's lots of mussels, shrimp, tube worms around as well. So these are just really um, fascinating endemic organisms that are, are native to the Costa Rican seas. So uh, that's the, the group one cores that we're really interested in, but we can start to sort of tease apart what the different geochemical differences are between these cores as well. Um, you can see the, this, the DNA plot I've, I've shown you here on the top left, and I'm just gonna layer on the different concentrations of different geochemistry uh, onto the top of those points. So on the top right, you can see the, the carbon-13 signal, which is indicative of methane oxidation. And you can see that all of the active points, again in circles, just show evidence of methane oxidation where all of the transition and inactive cores just flatly do not show any evidence of methane oxidation in terms of the, the carbon that's, that's uh, present in the pore water. Similarly, we're seeing uh, the same sort of trend in the sulfide. Remember that sulfide is, is also uh, generated by the process of methane oxidation by these ANME. And again, we're just, we're really only seeing sulfide present in the active cores writ large, but not a huge distinction between the, you know, the group one and group two cores. Iron two plus, uh, so this is uh, reduced iron, is a little more difficult to see here, um, but you can maybe tell that the active cores tend to have a little bit more iron than the transition inactive cores. This is a tough one because uh, iron is sort of going to be carried through these hydrothermal vent fluids in general. It's going to be a little more broadly distributed. But maybe if you know anything about geochemistry, you'll, you'll note that we're actually seeing quite a bit of iron II and sulfide sort of coexisting in the same uh, locations, which is typically not something that you're going to find. So there's active inputs of both iron and sulfide at these active cores. If we dig into the DNA a little bit, we can start to pull apart what the differences are at sort of a species level uh, distinction between these different groups of samples. Um, and so this is a heat map where the darker the color is, the, the more abundant a particular taxa is. I don't expect you to understand all of these different um, organisms, but I just wanna pull out some of the things that I notice. First, in the carbonates, we see a ton of ANME ones. So one particular subplate of ANME. We also see ANME ones show up in the group one cores, those group one cores from Gettysburg again. Um, 
by contrast, we really see almost no ME1s present in the group two cores. Those are the other active cores that aren't from Gettysburg. But by the time you get to transition cores, you basically have no ANME that we observe. Um, and instead, we've just got basically just generalized heterotrophs, anything that you find just sort of normally on the seafloor, uh, any background location. So what we can do is we can actually take this data and try to define what the center of the seep is, right? Because seeps are a lot trickier to sort of understand from a fundamental level than hydrothermal vents, where it's a really obvious um, input. Um, seeps are a lot more sort of diffused. It's, it's harder to tell where the center is, but we can actually use this DNA data to, to do that. So this is a technique I developed where we actually we sort of take the microbial community's uh, dissimilarity and we move that across the ge uh, geographical background, um, assuming that uh, there is some center and that it radiates outward. There should be a nice matchup between the microbial dissimilarity and the difference uh, in, in actual distance, like physical distance between these cores. And so when I do this analysis, we find that the group one cores are indeed indicated to be closest to the center of the seat. Um, so those are the Yetisburg cores uh, seem to be closest to the center. And that um, we sort of plot those in real space. Uh, it's a nice sort of sanity check for us where those group one cores, again, sort of look to be closest to the center of this distribution here, where they're in green, group two cores are in yellow on this map, and then uh, the transition and inactive cores are in red. So the group one cores are, in, are sort of in the middle. And you'll note here that I'm not just using the bathymetry as a background, but I'm actually also using um, photographs of the sea floor. And this is one particular um, aspect of our data that was really nice to be able to use. So we actually, because we had access to this AUV um, sentry, it went down, it took these photo maps of the sea floor, and we were able to compile these photo mosaics and stitch them together. What that allows us to do is to go through all of those photos too at a later date. Um, you know, so it's thousands and thousands of photos we're manually scrolling through and flagging them for uh, the presence and number of, of different animals, different megafauna at these seeps. And this allows us to make these really um, fascinating um, faunal presence and absence maps. Um, so it really shows us the distribution. Again, I'm going to uh, break this down a little bit because I think this can be a little bit hairy to look at. But I just want to point out this is a really fantastic data set for us to be able to uh, have access to and really showcases the power of, of these AUV maps. So what we did with these, this data is we actually just defined the centroid of the distribution between various different animal groups. Um, and that allows us to sort of uh, pick apart some of the ecology that exists at these sites. So I'm gonna start sort of on the, the southwestern side here, where you can see that the, the, we have the centroid for uh, vesica myid clams. So these are chemosynthetic symbiotic clams that do um, the consume sulfide. And you can see it's basically just clams down there. Now they live in the sediment. So there's not a lot of carbonate around, but as we move to the Northeast, we're actually starting to see more of the carbonate hard ground associated fauna, like tube worms, those, ye those yeti crabs, mussels uh, and the like. And once we get um, more towards the Northeast, um, we're really losing all of the clams. It's still lots of carbonate and we really are only seeing um, like scattered tube worms, occasionally mussels. And so what we interpret this to be is um, that the, the sort of most, the newest site is going to be uh, down here at the Southwest where carbonate hasn't had a chance to form yet. Um, and then the sort of more established communities are gonna be here in the center established and active, I should say, because those Kiwa Puravita, those Yeti crabs are sort of chasing down the methane and sulfide as they as they are able to find it. And then sort of a more relic community here towards the Northeast. So these are older, less active, the mussels have sort of died out and the Yeti crabs have migrated away. So this is a really nice way to, for, for us to sort of reconstruct the, the history of the seep over you know, an unknown time scale, but um, certainly uh, you know, within the last few decades. So just to show you kind of what that southwestern new site looks like, you can see there's really no carbonate to speak of, but we do have lots of microbial mat. And then we have some of these clams that I was talking about, these chemosynthetic clams, they look quite young. So these clams are only about four centimeters long, and we estimate they're probably, you know, less than two years old, essentially. We look at the, the geochemistry that we recover from the cores at this site, you can tell that um, uh, there's three passive traces we were looking at, we wouldn't expect to change much just in any uh, typical core. That's bromide, chloride, and fluoride. 
that's the, the red, blue, and black lines. And you can see there's a huge jump down uh, where there's a really um, stark uh, decrease in those uh, sort of passive seawater tracers, which really indicates to us that we're seeing quite a bit of, sort of freshwater input from the, the deep hydrothermal sources um, deep down where those subducting plates are actually giving us that water. Now, I did promise to talk a little bit about the carbonates as well. So um, I want to focus just a couple minutes on those carbonates themselves. That's those blue uh, points at this, on this NMDS. And just a reminder, these are really fantastic just uh, communities in general, where all of this carbonate is formed by direct action of microbial uh, methane oxidation. And if you're a geologist, they're just really fantastic rocks in general, um, full of lots of pore spaces and really interesting little nooks and crannies. Basically, all of the different carbonate minerals are represented, as well as just you know clays. And one of the things that's interesting about these carbonates is that they have been used in the past as uh, sort of nice, or they've attempted to be used as uh, indicators of what the like fossilized seeps sort of went through during their development stages. And what people do is they actually um, grind up these rocks and they look at the lipids that are inside of them um, as indicating uh, the different types of anime lineages that, that, that might have been inside those, those rocks when they were fossilized. And that's because different enemy lineage have slightly different proportions of some of these lipids. But one thing that our lab uh, noticed in 2014 it was that the, the uh, enemy that sort of have entombed themselves inside these rocks by their own activity are actually still alive and metabolizing. And so this can actually really throw off our, our estimations of what these, these fossil seeps would have done, right? Because if you're alive and metabolizing, that means the community can change. And so we really can't rely strictly on these um, lipid uh, analyses until we know how these rocks change over time. So I, to address this, I just did, oops, sorry, I did a really simple experiment where I just take rocks from different um, activity zones and I move them. And so this is uh, a, a transplant experiment of 16 months where we're moving rocks from the active site to less active regions. And here we're actually uh, splitting up the transition zone into inner transition and outer transition, just in terms of you know how far away they were. And we're also taking rocks from the inner transition site, again, moving them outward to less active regions, and then also moving them into more active regions to see, you know, sort of simulate uh, how these seep, uh, seep regions sort of really change dynamically over time. So uh, when we look at sort of the DNA here, it's a nice sort of sanity check for us again that we can indeed distinguish between natural non-transplanted rocks from these different activity zones. So we can distinguish between active inner transition and outer transition rocks where inner transition rocks actually seem like they have really high abundances of anne one that one particular methane or anne clay that I was talking about. And we can start to layer on some of the transplants to sort of get a sense here. So one thing I'm gonna start with just the active rocks that were moved well outside the zone of activity to really inactive regions. And one thing that we found that was really curious is that these rocks actually just don't change very much in terms of their composition. It seems like the community sort of freezes in place when you, when you move them way outside the zone of methane oxidation. And this is also true of IT carbonates, although I'm not going to show those here right now. But by contrast, when we move rocks for just to a slightly less active site, from going from the active to the inner transition rocks, we see that we form this sort of uh, intermediate uh, triangle here of samples where they sort of, they do actually sort of shift a little bit to move more like an uh, inner transition type community rather than just freeing, freezing in place. Now, when we look at instead moving those inner transition rocks back to the active site, so this is sort of trying to reactivate those communities, um, you'll see that uh, we actually see, get a much more sort of complex response where some of these rocks here in green really do reactivate. They look like active rocks again. Others just really don't. They look kind of like older transition, maybe you know, not so active rocks. And this really highlights the difficulty of working with these carbonates a little bit because the microbial communities, as you can see here on the right, tend to be really concentrated in little tiny pore spaces. And it's, uh, I think, we, we hypothesize anyway that we're just not seeing all of the community act reactivate at once when you move them back. So there's definitely a lag time. Again, our, our experiment was only 16 months long. So we, you know, we would expect that if you left those rocks there for even longer, you'd probably see an even more uh, drastic response. Now, the astute among you will note that I have sort of told you two different stories among about ANME-1, where ANME-1, this one particular subclade of ANME, was really present in the super active center of the seep sediments, but the ANME-1 was also most present at the inner transition sort of less active carbonates. So, you know, what gives Sean? 
And one, one clue that comes out of, uh, that we can use to sort of uh, tease this apart is uh, just the actual ecology of anime ones themselves. We've seen anime ones show up in lots of different types of environments from high methane activity to lower methane activity. And people are really puzzled over this for a long time. Um, but the anime ones themselves actually have slightly different um, arrangements with their sulfate reducing bacterial partners and other anime. You can see here in this, this um, uh, microscopy image that they seem to have a much looser association. You're not seeing those really tight, beautiful aggregates. And then sometimes they just sort of live on their own. Um, and we think this is actually directly related to their ability to survive inside carbonates. Um, and we've sort of dug through the literature a little bit to sort of support this hypothesis where previous uh, studies that have looked at carbonates have also found higher anime ones inside these lesser active carbonates. But even in the sediments where we find high anime ones and high anime in general, these really active sediments, we actually find high anime one associated with higher um, a carbonate presence just in the sediment. So this would be you know, microcrystalline grains of carbonate. So this really points us to a hypothesis that anime ones maybe are uh, directly associated with carbonate formation itself, rather than necessarily having a direct tie to particular concentrations of methane. So just break things down into sort of bite-sized chunks here. So sphere of influence of a seed. Well, we found three different distinct zones of activity at Mount 12, but most key was we found a much larger transition zone for animals than we found for microorganisms. The microbes tend to be really tightly associated with really you know, small zones of activity, that, um, but the faunal presence themselves is, is correlated both with the methane, but also has a lot of other sort of confounding factors, just including the presence of carbonate rock itself, which maybe takes years to, to create um, due to the fact that it's created by microorganisms. And this really highlights the fact that, you know, if we disrupt the center of a seep, if we were to disrupt the rocks, that would not only potentially um, disrupt the microorganisms at the center, but also really have um, impacts for the faunal presence all around. Um, in terms of the carbonates and sediments joint community differences, yes, absolutely, where sediments tend to um, have higher anime two, carbonates higher anime one, and sediments also just show a, a broader difference uh, overall. Uh, uh, anime themselves seem to be really interesting where we can maybe actually point to a, a possible uh, role in, for anime one in and carbonate formation and really um, uh, demonstrate that they are uh, better at surviving inside carbonates than their other anime brethren. Um, and in terms of carbonates being used as historical re recorders for seep activity, it's, we're still sort of at a maybe. So we saw um, some ability for carbonates to record things if they were moved to a drastically lower um, uh, level of seepage, but there's definitely still some ability for these communities to shift um, if the seepage just sort of changes gently. So with that, um, I'm hoping that I left a little bit of time for questions. I know I went quickly, um, but I'm happy to take any questions now or later in writing too. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm completely uh, fascinated by the Yetisburg in particular. Uh, there is a question. Let's go ahead and ask, uh, ask that first. Uh, do anime lineages form species-specific symbiosis with sulfate-reducing bacteria, or do they tend to partner with whichever organism is around that can reduce sulfate? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Yes, they do. There does seem to be some level of uh, species-specific association, um, and I didn't actually get into that too much. We're still sort of unraveling what all of those different um, associations are and how those are, are correlated. One thing that's interesting about the anime ones in the carbonates is that we actually just see almost no sulfate reducing partners in the carbonates at all. So there's really something funny going on inside the carbonates where the anime ones are, are you know, if, if, it's, if they're doing their metabolism with direct electron transfer, they're doing it in some weird way that we don't fully understand, um, maybe even without their sulfate reducing partner being close by at all. Great, thank you for answering that question. Uh, we actually don't have any more questions. I'm gonna give it a second because there is a, often a delay. Um, but meanwhile, I just wanna uh, remind you that uh, we do have this Kadas uh, presentation every month. It's the third Thursday of the month. And uh, we hope you will join us for another one in the future. Um, while we wait for potential questions, I wanted to ask if uh, you had any last uh, comments, either you or, or Kim or, or Elle. I would just say this is wonderful. It's really nice to be able to uh, to kind of get back into the science a little bit. So it's Absolutely. really nice to be able to this. 
Absolutely. No, thank you for, for presenting. This is really interesting. And I'm looking forward to sharing this on YouTube uh, so that more people can can hear about your research. All right. Well, I think that that that's it. Um, Kim, did you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, so just uh, on behalf of the Lunch and Learn Committee for the Knauss Fellows, uh, we are currently searching and kind of planning out our next couple months and ongoing presentations. Um, I think we're planning to send out a Google Form questionnaire um, to get a sense of people who might be interested in presenting, um, what kind of talks they'd like to do. So be on the lookout for that, um, fellow Knauss Fellows. And yeah, we're, we're excited to have more of these chats over the next year. I do love these Canals Fellows uh, presentations. They have a lot, a lot of interesting things to add to our to our knowledge here at NOAA. Um, well, I'd like to conclude by thanking our speakers for sharing their research today, kicking off the Canals Fellows 2021 series, and also to Kim for your great introductions today. And to the audience, I truly appreciate that you joined us for today's library seminar. We're proud to present the work of the NOAA community and to support the Canals Fellows, and we hope you will join us again. So everyone, be well.